All right, Mr. Lean Lording himself, Jason McDougall, welcome back to the podcast, buddy. I think this is either your second or third time on the show. I think second. It's been a long time, but a few years. A long time. I feel like back when you and I were in our prime in Dallas, it was like pre-COVID and the market was way different. But since we last had this interview, you have really found your niche in owning and managing your own rental properties. And you're actually teaching people how to do that on their own now, which is awesome, which will be the basis of this conversation. So before we get into all the nuts and bolts of that, just give everyone like a one minute overview on your career so far what you've done. Yeah, cool. So I started in real estate in 2016, started out by wholesaling properties and flipping and stuff. And then, man, I quickly realized like this is very transactional. I need to build passive income. So I'm not doing this every day. And then I thought about if I died unexpectedly, what is my wife and kids going to do? Rental portfolio was the, the path for me. And as I did that, I was broke at the time. So I'm like, I'm not paying anybody to manage these for me because I can't yeah. afford to. So I just learned how to self-manage them. And then throughout the years, made a lot of mistakes and found ways to get better and found ways to automate things and continue to keep all that in house. Fast forward today, we're at 48 properties now that we self-manage all in house with the help of one virtual assistant. It doesn't take a whole lot of my time each month and things are really efficient. We make sure that we are crossing our T's and dotting our I's all the time and making as much money as we can by managing that portfolio. Yeah, no, that's the way to do it, especially with 48 properties. That's a lot of self-management. Let me ask you this. Before we get into the self-management 101, you have 48 properties. If you did not want to do any more transactional deals, can you rely on that rental income or do you still need to do deals in order to live the lifestyle you want to live? Man, I think I have gotten a little too comfortable with that rental income. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so yeah, you can definitely live off of that and not have to do transactional deals. I think in 21 or 22, I think 22, I didn't do any flips or wholesales. I just bought, I think about 16 rentals that year and just kept them all. And that was my goal was like, man, I don't need to flip these anymore. I've got enough monthly income where it's not like I'm living lavishly on a yacht, but I'm able to live and continue to build my portfolio. So that was my focus. And you can get to that point pretty quickly. It snowballs, right? Yeah, especially if you're doing the burr, you can pretty much recycle the seed capital over and over again or if you're doing owner finance or creative deals, there's a lot of ways to get to that number because I feel like a lot of people, they hear the idea of the burr. It sounds great on paper and it obviously works. But the key with the burr that I've learned is that if you can get really good at finding deals and funding deals and, and knowing how to fill the deals up with tenants, you can really focus on just adding more rentals to the portfolio and letting those existing rentals produce income for you to live on versus a lot of people that listen to the show are in this flipping house mode or wholesaling mode, which I'm in. And you have to just keep hunting that deal. You get paid. I got one today that's going to be the best deal ever. It's a lot of money, but you got to go do it again. You got to go do it again. Exactly. Like I said, I mean, there's a, there's definitely some value in chasing that deal. I mean, it's fun, but it is something where you have to keep doing it in order to keep making money because people are rich dad, poor dad. They think they're going to buy three rentals and retire. That's just not how the world works. Um, yeah. I'm with you on that, man. I, I still flip houses now too, but yeah. for the other side of it, it's like you have to create revenue to maybe do some bigger deals, right? If you want to do commercial or something like that, it's harder to do the Burr method without being very creative in the commercial world. It's very transactional. And I think yeah. everybody's flipping needs to find a way to just keep a few of those each year. Well, that's what I tell like, people. I say, listen, like if you're really good at finding deals, you got to keep at least one or two properties a year or else you're going to just look back and really be resentful because yep. shit, I always say like, I've done over 200 deals now. Dude, if I kept 30 of them, I'd be in a much better net worth position than I am today. I'm still very proud of where I'm at. It's something that I think people need to be aware of it. And if you're aware of it, you'll obviously act on it. But a lot of people just get so blindsided to like wholesale. And there's a point where, yeah, you should definitely do three or four wholesales and save some money up and then you can put the money in the rentals. But you just get on this hamster wheel and you never have the mentality of owning assets. You're going to look back and you're going to say, man, I wish I kept more of these properties. In the last three, four years since we did the show, the values of properties all over the country have just exploded. In that first rental I bought for 65000 that thing's worth 275 k Like, Oh today. my God, dude. I got a great deal on that. It went up a lot. And that's my market. New York's a little bit more of a unicorn market, but it doesn't really matter. Even in Texas, it, it went crazy. So let's get into lean landlording. So first thing, I'm going to make this like we're having coffee and I'm confirming some of the stuff that I already do and I want you to critique me, right? So okay. I went through your course. By the way, I will promote your course at the end. It's phenomenal. I learned a bunch and I literally do this every day. So the biggest bottleneck I see with people who self manage is they are really bad at selecting tenants. And there's a process to do this because if you put bad tenants in your homes, not only are you doing them a disservice, but you're doing yourself a disservice and your team a disservice. So what do you do, Jason, to make sure you're reasonable with finding tenants and you're not like too picky, but at the same time, you have the the guardrails in place. Yeah, man, that's great. That's probably the biggest, I guess, leaky faucet. I think of all these things in your businesses as leaky faucets, something that is just dripping and costing you money all the time. Tenants are a huge one. If you pick the wrong 
wrong tenant, you're going to have a higher vacancy cost because you might have to evict them and you have to spend more time rehabbing the property or they're just not going to pay and you're going to be like hassling them for rent all the time and just wasting your yeah. time. So there's like different levels to that though, where you can screen tenants so well that your property never gets rented, right? Your tenant profile is so narrow where you can't get anybody in or you have a huge pool where maybe some people are getting through that should not be getting through. Yeah, And there's like a fine line there for determining what that is. So there's all these automation things you can put in place where tenants call like a pre-recorded number and get access instructions by uploading a picture of their ID and stuff like that to a vacant house. But you got to think if I or you were doing that, like looking for a house, I'm like, man, this kind of looks scammy. I'm not talking to anybody. I'm just going to upload my ID and get an access code. So I did that for a while. I tried it and I was like, this is awful. It took me like three weeks to lease a house in Fort Worth, which is usually like a three day lease. Oh my gosh, you never again. But you got to make sure that you are screening these tenants consistently the same way every single time and not leaving things up to like you remembering the questions to ask. And the only way that's done is by using a standard operating procedure, right? By having something written in place saying, okay, here's our rental criteria. Here's what we're looking for in a tenant. We're looking for two and a half times the rent. We're looking for no evictions in the past three years, no felonies in the past five years. How many pets do they have? How much do the pets weigh? Here's our pet rent fee. Here's our pet deposit. All these things where you have to screen these tenants and ask the same questions every time, request the same documentation from the tenants each time. And that doesn't eliminate the chances of you getting a bad one, but it really reduces it. You know what I mean? Where you're not stuck with a tenant that you're going to regret. 100%. That's gold, by the way, because if you have a standard operating procedure on how you screen tenants and filter through tenants, not only does it make the tenant's life easy in terms of they know what they need to do, but at the same time as a landlord, you know what you're looking for. I would say I'm a pretty pretty reasonable landlord. I'm, I'm reasonable when I need to be reasonable. But what I do, Jason, is I normally make them fill out a simple Google form, name, phone number, email address, what's their current address. I don't make them pay yep. anything. Nope. Just, and I get it on Google form so I can review the thing at once and just yep. see what's going on. And when do you want to move in? What do you work at? What's your estimated income? Do you have pets? I'll let a pet in and I just get a snapshot. And then once I go through that, I'll call them and I'll say, hey, let's have you come take a look at the property. But I already know what's going on. I know who I'm dealing with. I'm not just having some stranger call a voicemail and show up at my property. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. And that's great that you do that. I do the same thing where I have a free screening application Yeah, because exactly. I, again, I want the biggest pool of tenants to choose from yeah. and then I'll filter out from there. That's what or I do. my VA will filter out from funnel. there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Create the funnel. So I get that big pool of tenants. They all fill out a free application. Who's not willing yep. to do that? Yep. And then you get all the information. You're like, mm, I don't think that's going to be a good fit based yep. on whatever that you saw there. And you can just rule them out immediately. But yeah, that's a good way, good way to do it, man. 100%. And the thing I've noticed too is it creates a little resistance because if somebody's not willing to fill out a two-minute yep. free application to submit the next step in that case is we probably eliminate a few who don't want to comply with the application. And then the ones who are interested, obviously they're going to want to see it. I do have a lot of properties where I'm not there. So I will actually have them go there, but they will speak to me on the phone. I'll I'll never send someone to a house without speaking to them on the yeah. phone. I'll get a copy of their driver's license just to make sure they're- Dude, you have to. They say they are, yeah, yeah. But I'm not going and showing houses. You're not going no, and showing never, houses. That's never. just a waste of time. But if you talk to them on the phone, because you can like just tell things, man, you've been in oh, sales for sure. forever. So yeah. you can just talk to a person and be like, mm, this doesn't sound like someone I, I'm going to be enjoying having a relationship with, like business-wise. And then I'll give you a lockbox code to a vacant sure. house with, if you give me your ID. Yeah, exactly. It's a reasonable request. Because when I've rented properties as a tenant in the past, they, they always get a copy of my ID and then I see the unit. It's like very yeah. easy give and take kind of situation. Another thing I've noticed, Jason, and this is something I'm sure you've seen. If a tenant is eager as hell to get into my property, I always Red flag. skeptical. Yeah. Yes. I like the people who actually, oh, I think I could do this in a month. You don't want people who want to get in there right away. <laughs> no, dude. So there's two kinds of people, right? One of them is we release a lot of stuff through Facebook Marketplace. So yeah, I'll get like okay. a Facebook message and they'll say, hey, can I give you a call? I'm like, no, you cannot give me a call. You can fill out the free screening application first yeah. and we go from there. So if someone wants to talk on the phone before doing that, red flag. And number two, if they're like, I want to move tomorrow. I'm like, why do you need to move so quickly? What situation have you gotten yourself into that I'm about to take on by yeah. letting you move into my property? So yeah. yeah, that's good, dude. That's really good. If, if they say they're in a rush, I want to know why they're in a rush because like, yes. maybe they're actually in a rush and I can make an exception to that. But if they don't fill out the application and then they say they want to move in tomorrow and they want to give me a cash, like physical cash, I'm I'm a little weary of that. At least in my area, it's very hard to do evictions because of the way the laws are. So I'm, yeah. I'm a little bit more careful because I know that if I get somebody into one of my properties, it's not easy to get them out. Even if they just signed a lease and they're a new tenant, it's still going to take you four months at least. Jeez, four months? Yeah, because it's the 
courts, they don't take the eviction seriously. So they adjourn a lot of hearings and there's a whole legal process. It's not like Texas where you can just get them out in a month. I just did an eviction on one. The eviction started on December 13th and today is February 13th. They'll be out this Friday. I think there's a lot of that stuff going on in this, this particular courthouse. But yeah, man, you're right. You got to do your homework on the front end to make sure you're not getting a bad apple. Exactly. So once we do that, so we get a tenant in there, we do the right protocols. Another thing I look for, and I don't necessarily care as much, but it, I will look at their credit. If there's a medical thing, I'm cool with that. If there's yeah. something from way back in the day, I'm cool with that. But if they haven't paid any of their bills and they have default judgments against them and they're current, I'm not going to take the credit and have that kill their application, but I will look at that and just say, okay. And this is like for stuff that's kind of in their control, like paying their car loan or something. I do look at that and I, I use that as a little bit of a gauge. I will have that conversation with them and let them know, hey, this is what I'm seeing here. Let's talk about it. And if there's a problem with the credit and I like the tenant, I will generally get a co-signer with good credit. I'm very fair with people. Like I try to make exceptions if they're a good fit with all the other things. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm I've always felt the same way. If I treat them fairly and I'm a great landlord and offer them a great property, they're probably just gonna stay. I'm with you. I've had a five thirty credit before, so I get yeah, it. Life happens and I actually had a tenant I rented this was last year. They didn't have credit. Their friend was the co-signer with great credit. And I was like, dude, that works for me. No problem at all. So they were grateful. They had the income. That's another thing that we'll talk about and then we'll transition. But the income thing, if they are really pushing it with the income, I don't want them to feel super stressed about making that rent payment when there might be a cheaper option out there for them. If they don't have that two to three times worth rent, really sets them up to fail, which is what you don't want to have happen to them either. I don't want to see them in a situation where every single penny they're making is going towards my rent for whatever reason. I want them to not have to struggle. Yeah, hundred percent. Like two and a half times is my minimum yep. of what I like to see. And you're right. Like a lot of people are like paycheck to paycheck, but if they're on a focus solely on monthly payments, they're like, I can afford this. I'm like, man, at two times the rent? No, you can't. You are going to be moving out in three months on your own will because you're like, I just can't afford this yeah. anymore. And then I'm back on square one with vacancy fee. Exactly. And I found the cosigner to be pretty beneficial. A totally reasonable thing because a lot of landlords yes. are just so stern with things. It's I get it. But at the same time, there's always a way to work it out if the tenant's a good fit. The thing with the rentals is I want the tenants to be successful. I don't want to ever evict anybody. I want them to stay there as long as they want. I want to be a good landlord and have a good relationship. And I want to see them succeed by having these protocols in place. So let's actually shift over to another point where people have an issue self-managing. And it's the actual maintenance calls and the process of getting things done to that property that may need to get done. Because a yeah. lot of people say they don't like rentals because they don't like getting phone calls at three in the morning, but I never get phone calls at three in the morning because I don't have my business set up to where that would ever happen. That's right. You got to set up right from the front end. You set it yeah. exactly, dude. You got to have systems in place. You've got rentals in multiple markets. I've got rentals yep. in multiple markets and I've built vendor relationships in multiple markets and we load those into our property management software. So a virtual assistant gets the maintenance request. So all, all tenants have to submit the maintenance request through their resident portal in our management software. That's the only way we take them. You get everything in there. So when that comes through, my virtual assistant will take that task and she'll see, okay, this property is in Fort Worth. So she'll go to our property management software and see, okay, for DFW plumbers, here's my choice of three different vendors that we've already established relationships with. And these vendors already have electronic payments set up through our platform. She'll dispatch the call to the, the maintenance person through a text message, give them the contact information for the tenant, and that vendor will schedule the maintenance request or the repair. We get an invoice back from the vendor when it's completed, and my virtual assistant will pay that invoice through our software to the vendor. And I'm like out of it completely if it's under $500. If it's over $500, it's got to come to me for approval. But under $500, I don't even see them, man. It just gets done. Yeah, it just shows up as a line item. Yeah, exactly. And again, a standard operating procedure for maintenance requests. What happens? When do we determine if it's customer abuse and we need to build a tenant for that? When do we determine if it's a warranty issue and the vendor should cover that under warranty like for re recurring repairs? So all those things are established where for you and me to do that, our time is better spent finding deals. That's exactly correct. And the thing with the standard procedure is when you're dealing with maintenance requests, you never want he said, she said telephone calls. It's always got to be in writing, whether yeah. it's a message, an email or an online portal submission. Yep. You have records of it because in the event that you do something over the phone, that's not on the record. But if yep. they document it and then you document it back, if they try to go after you and say you never fix this, you literally pull up the file and say, hey, like this is exactly what happened. These are all the messages and these are all the communication with the plumber. This got fixed. This invoice got closed. You can't go back at the landlord and the landlord can't go back on the tenant. It just yep. keeps the transparency there because it does. when you have a lot of units like you, there's always something going on. Another nugget I've found with tenants, and this works pretty much 90% of the time, is the things that break 
break that are easy are like dishwashers and washing machines. And if the thing was used before I bought the property, that's one thing. But if I put a brand new washer or a brand new dishwasher in there, generally I try to have the tenant pay for that because if it's brand new, the only way it will break is generally if the tenant does something. So that just reduces some liability on my end. Sometimes I'll fix it. It really depends. But a lot of the times I'll tell the tenant up front, listen, these are brand new. They've never been touched. They're working. So this breaks and we'll have to talk about what the cost is going to be because those things break a lot. It all depends. Everything is on a case-by-case basis. I try to limit what appliances I put in the properties. If there's room for a dishwasher when I buy the house, I'll replace the dishwasher. Ovens, okay, but uh, we don't do fridges in any units at all. Oh, I always Um, do fridges. Yeah, and I think it depends on the state that you're in. So in Texas, it's fairly common for the properties not to have fridges. The only thing that we provide typically is a dishwasher if there's, again, space for it. And if there's a built-in microwave like on a vent hood, then we'll leave that. Otherwise, nothing else. Interesting. You can have checks and balances in place too. They walk the unit before. Like the plumbing stuff, that is 100% real. But with with some kind of odds and ends, let's talk about this and see what really happened before we decide how to go about it. Because some tenants will abuse that property because it isn't theirs. And I get it. But at the same time, if you can do a good job up front screening tenants and getting the right people in there who appreciate the property, you're going to minimize your maintenance calls. My tenants don't call me that often because there's really nothing to be called because these properties are all in really good shape. And if it's it's really a problem, of course, fix it. But a lot of the good tenants don't really call you that often because they know, hey, I was delivered a great property. I'm going to take good care of it. And if they're taking good care of the property, you're obviously going to have less chances of them calling you for something. If you're screening for good tenants and you have good tenants, there's two types of tenants that don't call you though, right? There's like the great tenants that don't call you and the house is immaculate. And then there's the tenants that don't call you and you haven't been the property in five years and you go and you're like, it's a roach infested hoarder house. Um, Yeah. I've had that happen. I have one right now like that, but it is what it happens, man. We, We do semi annual maintenance inspections just to prevent that very thing from happening. Look at the property. Are you taking reasonably good care of it? If you are, you can stay. If not, I'm not renewing your lease and we're going to terminate the lease. So you got to maintain your asset. So we covered the operations, the property and maintenance calls. We covered screening tenants. Now let, let's get into the whole move out process. Like when you have a tenant who communicates to you, they do not want to renew their lease. How do you handle the process to them move out and then also have them hopefully keep their security? Because I love giving security deposits back. Me too. Love it. It's not my money, it's theirs. I no. want them to have their money back. So what is your process internally for doing that? So I put in the lease that we have to have 60 days notice. If someone gives me 30 days notice, I'll probably take it and be fine with that. Yeah, me too. But I try to get 60 days notice just to prepare things on my end. So I got one today. Someone said they're moving out in 60 days. I already have pictures from when I leased that property originally. And so I will pre-lease that property when we're 30 days out. I'll put it on all the marketing websites and try to lease that property out. So when they move out, I can have a minimal make ready and move somebody in within a few days to a week later. So a few things have to happen. When they give that 60 day notice, we go do an inspection of the property and we have a checklist that we go through to see what's going to need to be done during the make ready. So that way, whenever the tenant does move out, we've already already got an idea of exactly what needs to be done. We've got a contractor or a handyman already scheduled and lined up to go in there the day the tenant moves out to perform the repairs. And then hopefully we have a good handful of potential applicants that want to see that property as soon as the make ready is completed because we've been pre-leasing it for 30 or 60 days. We'll put a sign on the yard and I tell the tenant like, hey, I'm putting the sign on the yard. I'm putting it up for lease. If people are dropping by and looking out the window, that's what's going on. You got to try to reduce your vacancy costs. That's the biggest killer, man, is the vacancy cost. Yep. That's what smokes people, man. And that's a great process you have. You want to pre-fill up, you can spend a couple of days fixing it. They move in and give you the security deposit and then you yeah. have their old security deposit back. They can use that for their next rental because- 100%. Yeah. And I see a lot of people too with market pricing. They try to shoot for the moon with rent and it's like, you're going to spend way more money and lose more money trying to get some unicorn rent number when you just yep. go market rent or slightly under. 100%. People are going to be flocking to your door. That's right, dude. Exactly. Or even one month to fill it. <laughs> if you're a hundred bucks high on the rent and your extra vacancy is four extra weeks, that's going to kill your entire plan for getting that extra hundred bucks. So price it accordingly to the market. And then you hit it on pets earlier. Everybody has pets. That's like a, an extension of their family. So if someone said you can't bring your dog, I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna go somewhere else. Yeah, it's crazy. It doesn't bother me as long as I know the pet's in there. And the only thing with pets that I get a little concerned about is if the pet bites somebody and then it's at your property, but you can get renter's insurance, which everyone has to have, obviously. Yep, that's mandatory. You know, and that it is what it is out of your control. You just do your best, right? I think if landlords are not gonna rent people with pets, they're gonna be waiting a long time to get good customers in their door because every other person in America has a pet and they should. Absolutely. If you do the right types of rehab to your properties, i.e. no carpet, 
doesn't matter. Yeah. It's not a big deal. <laughs> yes. It doesn't bother me. We do glue down vinyl plank flooring. Yeah. And that way, if like it gets destroyed, you peel up a couple planks. But usually most people that are pet owners are responsible and they miss you. Exactly. So Jason, you made a whole training program on this. You spent a lot of time. I went through it. It's a great course. So who would be the number one person that would benefit from this? And what, what else do you cover in that course that they could definitely check out? So I think the people that would benefit would be even if they have one rental property, as long as they're interested in growing their portfolio and adding more rental properties. I would start with one, all these systems in place with one property, because if you get to two and you're self-managing, then you get to 10, that's a lot. That's a lot of work that comes in. So if you can have these systems in place from the beginning, it's a lot easier to manage that and grow and scale efficiently. You do um, it right way off the bat. Yeah, man. Have the right processes in place and, and learn from the mistakes that I've made where I've screwed up a lot of stuff. And I was like, let's put a system in place for that. Let's automate this. Let's figure out a better way to do things to remove some bottlenecks and create some efficiencies. And you go into super detail in that course, dude. I, I couldn't believe the amount of detail you go into with every single step because you are a very systems-oriented person. I've known you for years now. If someone just follows that blueprint, they could handle as many properties as their heart desires. You could manage 100 by yourself with a VA. It wouldn't be a problem with this. But no. a lot of that stuff is very in the weeds and very detailed. But I feel if somebody got into that and they pulled out a few nuggets here and there and just implemented things slowly over the course of several months, then after a year, you'd be like, my shit's pretty automated and it's running pretty smooth. I've got all these processes in place. I got a VA that's handling the day-to-day -day stuff and you're out of it. You know what I mean? For the most 100%. part. And I'll um, tell you what, your course is a lot cheaper than paying a property manager for the rest of your life. Hell yeah. Even for a year, a property manager is more than a thousand bucks. It's 10% of the rent per month. Plus usually they charge you a one month's rent to lease a property yep. up, right? Yep. Exactly. So Jason, if people wanted to check this course out, what is the best way for them? You're going to have a unique link for people to sign up for the program. You can add that to your show notes. They can also visit lanelandlording.com and enter coupon code Greg, and that'll give them $100 off to sign up for Lean Landlording. Perfect. So we'll put the link in the description here. And then if they wanted to just check it out and get the coupon code leanlandlording.com, put in yep. the coupon code Greg yep. for the special deal. And Jason, if people want to connect with you, what is the best way for them to reach you? Yeah, Facebook's the best way. Send me a message on Facebook, Jason McDougal, and I'd be happy to chat about this stuff. We've also got a Lean Landlording Mastermind private group on Facebook. Um, where, man, there's some really smart people that are talking about some stuff in there, which I love and I'm learning from. So I benefit from this stuff too, right? A rising tide lifts all ships, my friends. Yeah, dude. I love that. That's right. Jason, thanks so much for uh, jumping on the podcast today. I'm sure some people are definitely checking out that course after they hear this and I will catch you on the next one. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, Greg. I appreciate it.